This episode is sponsored by Apollo, a tool that's helping me to open doors and close deals faster. Wanted to share it with you. Apollo is a complete end-to-end sales platform, letting you email, dial, connect on social, build plays, and schedule meetings. With conversational intelligence, transcribing my calls lately, and reminding me to act on my next steps to drive deals across the finish line, it's been a lifesaver. It's no wonder Apollo is the most loved sales tool on the planet. Thousands of users rank Apollo as a top tool on G2. Start today completely free and see how Jesse and I use Apollo. Sign up in the show notes below or at thesalesplayers.com forward slash Apollo. That's thesalesplayers.com forward slash A-P-O-L-L-O to start your free trial. So uh, this episode, Chase and I were talking a little bit offline about wealth building in the sales industry, specifically tools that you as a seller can utilize to grow your net worth. We want to preface this episode. We are not financial advisors, (laughs) you know, just uh, don't don't want to, don't want, don't want that to come after us, but no. So part of this was prompted by another Reddit post that we found on the sales subreddit. If you're not in there, I highly recommend it. It's just a, a, a fun way to get connected to the sales community. There are a lot of tech sellers in there, but what's interesting to me is also hearing from people that sell like heavy machinery or media or logistics or whatever other service they sell. Um, it's kind of interesting to hear what their OTEs are and how they do. So it's a great community in there. And I stumbled across this question that says, uh, how are reps building long-term wealth? And I'll just read the post here. Uh, then we can kind of chatter about it and, and talk about the things we're working on. So it says, for those of you earning six figures and above, how are you investing your money? I'm asking because I've lost a lot of money trying to build my own businesses and never figured it out. I'm simply looking for vehicles outside of entrepreneurship where I can begin to grow my net worth. So far, I've only seen real estate, stocks, retirement and pension, and crypto. Anywhere else, thank you. Wow. And you know what you know what they call me, Jesse? No, let's hear it. The recovering entrepreneur turned SaaS sales executive. There it is. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. Like, do, so- you know, like uh, being being a business owner isn't always what it's cracked up to be. And I think this person just hit the nail on the head. As you know, you might be bringing in revenue for your business could be hundreds of thousands, could be a million dollars, but your expenses could be a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, and you're not making any money. Yeah, and I think that we see we have a culture of where everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. It's very glitzy and grand, glamour, glamorous, but at the truth of it, it it can be very hard and it can be very not uh, profitable. It can be a hobby, yeah. you know, where you're just paying to work or paying somebody else to work for you, which I've been, and that's not a good place to be. Yeah. Do you think that for the right person though, it's a way to to build wealth quickly is to start a business or is pro- maybe quickly, maybe the wrong word in that context, but yeah. Um, I, I think that, you know, create starting a business and, and the two businesses that I've been involved with um, have my first business was a valet company. So it was a, we were doing valet parking, parking lot management. That was a service-based business. There was a lot more profit in that business than there was in Life Bar, which was a juice and smoothie bar. Mm -hmm. Um, Both were risky, uh, but I learned a lot with both of those. I mean, both of them were profitable, uh, but was I making huge, like million, was I making $100,000 a year? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a lot of work. I was building something. I was able to sell my valet company, but it was at a cost. Um, I learned a lot. I was very young. I think if I had to do it over, if I did it over again, I would do things differently, but um, I really enjoy working for somebody else. I have these weird things called uh, paid vacations. (laughs) Uh, 
Weekend. I got weekends. Uh, yeah, holidays. It's very strange. I'm not used to this. You're guaranteed a check every two weeks. Uh, it's uh, yeah, and every two weeks is opposite. I used to be freaking out every two weeks of how am I going to cover payroll? What am I going to do here? Yeah, you know. So yeah. it, there's a lot of stress with uh, owning your own business. Yeah, and I'm I'm a big fan. I still think that entrepreneurship and business ownership is is a major path to building wealth uh in in this day and age and and kind of always right mm -hmm. so i think that there's a lot of opportunity to do that without having a lot of the overhead and that's why i've dabbled in a lot of more like side hustle type companies uh while still working a day job trying to find stuff that was relevant to what i already do right i already have these skill sets of being able to pick up the phone and call somebody and get something done or you know, build a contract and an order form and manage a spreadsheet of, of expenses. I already know how to do those things. What are some businesses that I can start that don't take very much time to run? What are some assets that I can build maybe a little bit more slowly than if I went both feet into entrepreneurship, but I can still put some extra funds in my pocket at the end of the month without, you know, the overhead or the risk of, of being a full-time entrepreneur. So let's talk about some of those things. Uh, this, I'm just, sifting through the comments on this, this Reddit and you, how many karma points do you have? Uh, Jesse, do you have a lot of karma points on Reddit? Um, 210 karma. I don't think that's a lot. No. Um, I've, I've commented on a few things, particularly okay. the sales channel is probably the one that I'm most active in, but okay. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, my username, I'm not going to share, but I might create another <laughs> one. That's like uh, a non anonymous username on Reddit. You can find me on uh, at Mr. Life Bar on Reddit. On Reddit. And I have about a thousand, I don't know, oh. a bunch of credit karma points. And guess what? I landed my first ICP deal through Reddit. In in your role now or in your past role? In my first uh, AE role. Yeah. Really? Yeah. What kind of communities were you in? I was looking for PPC. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's actually a really interesting place to learn about other topics. Like there's, there's usually industry specific subreddits sales is a huge one, but there's also for your buyer persona, there's, I know there's a DevOps subreddit, you know, there's, there's marketing subreddits. So whoever you're selling to um, there's riches and niches. Yep. You can find them. There's likely a subreddit for it. So yeah, let's read through a couple of the comments here. The first one I agree with and actually shared this on a, podcast episode a few months back, which is if you work in sales, you should try your hardest and it doesn't happen overnight, but live on your base salary, invest your bonus. A couple of assumptions there is that you have a base salary and you're not commission only and that you get commissions or bonuses. You might be, I guess, flat, a flat rate seller or something. Stranger things. I've heard of stranger things than that, but you know, assuming that you're out there making a base salary and a commission, is there a way you can figure out how to live on your base salary and then invest your bonuses, your commissions into, they don't say what to invest in, in this comment, but we'll share a couple of ideas. I'll definitely share what I invest in and how mm -hmm. I think about that. Um, you know, what my goals are there, but I do think that that's a good place to start. If you're listening right now and you've not thought much about how to grow your wealth, start there, figure out how you can completely live on your base salary or even like 80% of your base salary invest, you know, the 20% of your base salary in something, and then put all of your commissions into things that are investments. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about then some ideas here. I'm just, again, scanning the the thread here. I'm seeing things like real estate and ETF. What, what do you, yeah. Like, what are you, what, what are you do, Jesse? Yeah. What's yeah, your, well, what are you doing? So there's a, there's a few philosophies that I've lived by for many years now. I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad in my early 20s. It was recommended by several relatives that I pick up Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And while I'm not a huge fan of Robert Kiyosaki in 2023, he's a little unhinged. Go, go check out his Twitter handle. He's, he's kind of off the rails, but like that book. Really? And also some people allege that he didn't write Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It was, I, I, don't, I shouldn't say allege. I think that's true. What? Uh, it was ghost written and Robert Kiyosaki was kind of like the face of it and like the oh. marketing machine behind it. So I read that years ago and there was a few things I think that I picked up from that book. One is pay yourself first. And I remember the first time I read that, I was like, that's so stupid. That doesn't make any sense. And like, what do, what do they mean by that? 
And it took me many years to sort of realize what that mindset, uh, mindset shift is pay yourself first. So how I think about pay yourself first. And, and he even says in the book, he's like, make sure he's like, I'm not telling you not to pay your bills or pay your credit card bills or your rent or whatever. I'm telling you that you should pay yourself first. Most people will earn their income, spend, you know, on their food and their rent and all their expenses, their car payment, their whatever. And then whatever's left over, that's the, that's what gets saved or invested. And in my mid twenties, I just shifted that mindset and said, I pay myself first, everybody else waits. Uh, so the first thing that happens when I get payroll or a big lump sum of money is some portion of that gets either saved or, you know, in, in the last several years, I, probably the last seven years or so, I've focused heavily on investing in stocks and bonds. And I'll get more into how I do that and what that is. And again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just sharing what I do. So paying yourself first, how can you set aside money first and then pay the people you owe money to, whether that's your landlord or your mortgage bank or, you know, whatever, the grocery store, pay yourself first, set aside something first before it all gets spoken for by the people you have to pay every single month to, to live and survive. It's a really strange, but small, but strange mindset shift that actually will really empower you to start saving. So what I did first was I just started trying to save as much as I could for a really long time in my sales career. It was not possible to live on my base or sorry, not, not possible to live completely on my base salary because my base was mm -hmm. so low. So I think the next thing that a uh, piece of advice that, that it talks about in that book and in other books I've read is then you got to start figuring out how to raise your income as much as you can. And you can do that by investing in yourself. That's another cliche you hear a lot is what does it mean to invest in yourself? And we've talked a lot about it on the show. I think listening to this podcast is hopefully an investment in yourself. You're learning how to be a better seller, a better manager of your career, which will then put you on a path towards um, making more money, right? If you can sell more, you get better at this, you get promoted, you know, you move companies, you can command a higher salary, et cetera, et cetera, right? So learn how to make more money. And there's so many ways you can do that. And I think in sales, it's so easy because if you produce, you can double your income in a minute, right? <laughs> like in a year, in a year, you can double your income. If you, if you hit your quota in most tech sales roles, that's the case. I think in a lot of other industries, that's the case as well. Figure out how you can do that. And then as you start to let, like anchor up your base salary, it gets easier and easier to pay all your bills on the base and invest your commissions the next thing I always talk about or that I did for myself was just started to pay down liabilities. So mm -hmm. if you've got credit card debt, if you have student loans, uh, start with those first. High interest debt first is my philosophy. Um, credit cards, usually one that's pretty high interest. Student loans can be pretty high interest. So focus on those. If you have those, you know, lower interest debt can take a backseat for a little while. Um, I'm not a huge proponent or fan of like paying a mortgage off. I think if you have a house and a mortgage and it's not a, you know, an extremely high interest rate, I think just pay your monthly and a little extra if you can, but I actually think that you'll be better off investing than trying to pay off a mortgage quickly. That's my personal hot take, but I know people who've paid off their mortgage and they probably feel warm and cozy at night knowing that no matter what happens, you've got a roof over your head, right? What they don't think about is you still owe taxes on that property and now you don't have the bank as sort of a financial shield around that property because if you own it outright, you're responsible for a lot of the liabilities. If I still have a mortgage on it, my mortgage bank is still has ownership in my property and they have my property in their best interests as well as mine. So if someone trips and falls and breaks their neck on my property, I might be able to get legal resources from my mortgage bank to help, you know, fend that off. So Again, guys, I'm not an expert on Holy this. Holy cow. We've got but, deep on this. Holy yeah, cow. Something to think about though. I know a lot of people that they're in game is like, I got to pay off a house and, and have a house outright. Um, I have relatives that are that way. And again, I'm stoked for those people. I think it is obviously peace of mind, but I don't think it's the only way. And I don't think it's the best use of, of resources, especially early on in your career. So I'll pause there. Any questions or commentary before I jump into some of the like, vehicles that I use. And then I want to hear about some of the vehicles that, that you've deployed chase. No questions. Uh, love what you're saying. So keep going. Cool. So the, the, when I was 21 
And I, again, I think I shared this in an episode a few months back, but I'll recap it again here. We're, we're in a new year. People are focused on setting, setting themselves up for a huge financial year. And I think personally, I don't have a crystal ball or anything, but I think 2024 is going to be a more economically uh, rewarding year than 2023 was. But anyhow, when I was 21, a relative told me that I should look at investing in ETFs and mutual funds, or sorry, ETFs and index funds. And, um, you know, pretty much the next week I was opening up an account with Vanguard, which is the largest, basically the largest index fund there. The, the guy who started Vanguard was actually the creator of the index fund. And if you're not familiar with what all these terms are, there's like Investopedia and a bunch of other resources out there. There's a gajillion YouTube videos that aren't, you know, is not, not typically focused on sales that are just focused on this topic, but I'll give you a quick kind of overview an index fund is basically just ownership in a in a in a fund that has lots of different companies stocks in it so you might be in like an S&P 500 index fund and that's going to have a little piece of every one of the S&P 500 companies in your fund right and you're sharing your money you're you're kind of you know putting your money in and it's getting put uh, combined in with other people's money that are in that same fund and they tend to grow pretty well um i focus pretty heavy on just like us domestic stocks uh, and funds that carry U.S. domestic stocks. I have one that's a total stock market index fund, very popular. That's through Vanguard. And that basically indexes, or in, in other words, it has little pieces of the entire market in it, you know, little shares of, of the entire market. So it indexes the U.S. Uh, total stock market. And there's international ones. There's all kinds of things like that. But I would say if you're under 40 a pretty significant percentage of your money should go into U.S. stocks. And again, I'm not a stock advisor. This is just what I've done. And my strong opinion is these are great ways to park your money for growth. I'm trying to remember what the return was. Someone just posted, it was like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's double digit return every year for the most part. There's probably been some years where it dips below that, but on average. Have you, my question is, have you touched this money since you've invested or no? Well, here's what's really cool about I've invested through a Roth IRA, which is a retirement vehicle. And you interest in tons of detail about Roths. One of the cool things about Roths is you can touch it um, for certain things, penalty-free, tax-free. One of those things is buying your first home. So I did access some of it to buy a first home. You can use it for school, uh, like college. So I started, you know, I didn't start till I was 21, but had my parents started one for me when I was 12. I could have taken some of that money out to pay for my college mm -hmm. health bills and things like that. So if you have, you know, medical bills or you, you've got to go get hospitalized, you can use your Roth for those expenses, tax-free, penalty-free. So all of the money I put into these index funds, I start with a Roth IRA. Now the catch with a Roth is you can only put, I think six or 6,500. 6, yeah. Per person. So if you're someone who's married, you know, make sure your spouse is doing the same. That's a good, you know, rule of thumb try to get both couples doing that, you know, so it's 12 to 13 K a year that you've got to set aside. So if you have a big commission check, that's 13 K, you can just do it all at once. I actually don't recommend doing it all at once. I practice something called dollar cost averaging, which is a monthly amount in spread out over the year. That way I don't just put, you know, 6,500 in on the same day. Cause then I'm buying shares at that one day's price and it, you know, the market's going to fluctuate, but if you're buying, consistently over the course of the year, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but it's going to average out dollar cost averaging. Again, these are topics that if you're curious about, you can go read up on, on Investopedia, watch YouTube videos on, go to TikTok, wherever, you know, wherever you want to go find more depth on this. I'm just giving you an overview of what I've done. And so over the years that's compounded, you know, your, your dividends get reinvested from those stocks. And then you're just growing these funds. And that's, that's how you start to kind of plan for retirement. You know, along the way, I've also purchased some bonds, like there, some of that money's in very lightly in bonds, um, a smaller percentage because I'm more risk tolerant. Uh, I still feel like I'm pretty young. Maybe, you know, in the next five or 10 years, I might start to shift more towards bonds from stock. But I think putting money into the stock market's a big deal and everyone should be doing it. US stocks, you know, index funds through retirement tax advantaged accounts like a Roth IRA. It's like the best deal in finance. And it's funny because they don't teach this stuff to you in high school. If it weren't for a relative sitting me down and saying, you've got to open up a Roth IRA as soon as you can, because 
you're going to get the benefits of compound interest of interest. If you start in your twenties versus starting in your forties. So the longer you have the account open, the more those dividends reinvest and you buy more shit, you know, it auto buys more shares. My account just right. buys more shares and it's this, you know, snowball of growth. Now, again, we could have some national calamity and my entire nest egg could get wiped out. I don't think that's going to happen because it's spread across so many U S companies and probably international companies. I need to go check my portfolio, but like, you know, there's, there's national and international companies in there. So the odds of every single one of those companies failing, and we're talking companies like Wells Fargo and Meta and, and Johnson and Johnson and Walmart and Coca-Cola, like it's spread across all kinds of industries which I like, I don't want to be, you know, too tied to one industry. So if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I wanna put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSurf5, don't forget the E at the end of Surf, that's JWSurf5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. I'll pause there before I move into the next couple of things. Well, I want to just talk like yeah, the please. first thing I didn't realize is uh, this job that I just moved to, Hyros, we have a 401k. Yeah. And I didn't realize that the 401k is pre-taxed revenue, it's going to get taxed when you take it out from that, but it's going to drop down your base salary. So you're able to put in for the year of 2023, I'm looking, you can put in $22,500. So that could take your $100,000 base salary down to uh, 77.5, I think. Yeah, uh, and so then that's lowering your tax bracket and it's you're sometimes, you know, your company will match you. And so this is just a, a great thing to do. And it's putting it, you can put it in those same funds that Jesse was just talking about. Yeah. So 401k is another tax advantaged account. It's you know, the reason that I've leaned Roth is because most of my career up to recently was in early, early startups that either they offered a 401k, but they didn't offer a match. And so for me, it was just easier to take control of my investing, but in the last two years, I actually had a very generous 401k package uh, that I that had. I, I won't say the percentages on the air because I'm not trying to flex on anybody, but it had a very generous match from the company. And so I maxed that out two years in a row. Um, and yeah, it lowers your it lowers your your take home because you're putting that money into the investment, but that's going in there tax free, which is pretty awesome. So I didn't mention with Roths too, the 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 that's post tax, right? With Roths, you um, you actually pay taxes up front. On, the way, on the way in. Yep. And then the, the idea is that if you take it out when you're 65, you hypothetically will be in a higher tax bracket, but you've already paid the taxes on those when they went in. And so you can get that money out tax-free. I also have a traditional Roth, or sorry, a traditional IRA. There's Roth and traditional. I also have a traditional one. You got to work your way up to that stuff. For a long time, I just had Roth. One of the downsides to Roth is that you can you can exceed the income limits. I don't remember what those are. I think if you make over like 200 and something K, then you can't invest in a Roth. You make too much money to invest in a Roth. It's like 208K. So anyway, beyond like these retirement, start there, retirement stuff and 401Ks if your employer has- Just one. open the account. That's the whole thing is open the account. Just- Bite the bullet, open the account, set it up. And I've, what, yeah. And, and most be on any of these things. Right. And most of them have like an auto invest. See if you can yep. start auto investing 50 bucks, a hundred bucks and work your way up to these like 500 or whatever it is a month. And then again, when you get a big commission check, you can, 
you know, you can maybe move that to a savings account and max those contributions out more. So outside of that, I've done a little bit of like individual stock ownership just for fun. Like I'll buy individual tech stocks that I understand the industry around. Um, lastly, I have a little bit of money parked in actual software startups that were, um, that I was invited to participate as like an angel investor. And those are really small bets. They're, they're in the thousands of dollars, not tens of thousands of dollars, really. So a couple of those to date, none of those have paid me yet. Those are all kind of, in my mind, longer term investments and a little bit more of a roll of the dice, hoping that they'll, uh, have an exit event or a liquidity event that puts a big check in my pocket. So that's pretty much it. You know, all of that comes, in my opinion, after investing in yourself, your skill sets, you know, investing in your knowledge, reading books, courses, all those kind of things I think are really important first, because really the most important thing is increasing your earnings. So you have the extra money to then begin investing those commission checks, putting those into things like stocks or being an angel investor in startups or starting a side hustle, whatever that is, being able to pay for the tools to start a side hustle. You know, the one thing that I've invested into my entire life has been myself and the, probably the number one tool that has benefited me and I've consistently done it. I probably should have been investing in the stock market the entire time, but has been audible and just wow. having, uh, listening to different audiobooks and just continuously learning more and more, um, in investing in myself. I think that's one of the biggest things, but Again, I want to just reiterate of just sometimes I get stuck on the small details of just not opening the damn account. And it is very simple. There are tools out there. There's Wealthfront, there's SoFi, there's Robinhood, a bunch of different things you can do. And they make it very simple. Yeah. And uh, it's just doing it. And that's one of the things I think I've made it so complex in my life. I'm like, Oh, I got to have a financial advisor. I got to do all this. That's bullshit. No, I just need to just do it. And so that's what I'm really focused on in 2024 is really maxing out that 401k, hopefully then maxing out a, uh, Roth and then maxing out some other, uh, other things. Do you touch on something really interesting, which is it used to be that you had to hire a broker. There's all this gatekeeping around it. And then there's like brokerage fees. What I like about using things like Betterment and Vanguard, and I think Schwab also is another really good one. And again, you know, do your research, pick your favorite one. But a lot of these will, you don't have to use a broker to buy these. You can manage your own portfolio and that comes at a lower cost to you. They, um, something to look at when you're investing is the expense ratio. Uh, look for really low expense ratios, like sub 1%, actually sub like half a percent is a good expense ratio. That's the amount of money that they charge you in fees for managing your money there. So a lot of these firms have really high expense ratios because they have an actual broker that manages your money. Vanguard has super low expense ratios. I think Schwab, the same thing. Fidelity is another one that's pretty good. So look into those and yeah, just get started. Just do something, start putting 20 50, a hundred bucks, whatever you can aside every single month. And you can start by just putting that in a savings account and then move it as you feel comfortable. But the key is just getting started. So before we wrap up too, I just want to give a quick idea of where I'm heading in terms of my investment, what I want to start doing next in this year and years beyond. I've not done much with real estate. Uh, I am a homeowner, but I don't have, you know, any kind of rental or real estate properties. And I think that's also a really great thing for sellers, especially the ones that are making pretty big commissions that can put, you know, that can save up a down payment on an investment property relatively quickly. That's a great asset to own is, you know, rental properties, fixer upper type houses that you can flip and sell. So I think for me, the next journey is exploring, and I've done this actually already. I've talked to a realtor about trying to get my uh, get myself a, a investment property, like a, a duplex or something like that to rent out. And it's been a little bit of a slow burn, but that's probably the next thing for me. Mm -hmm. And then of course, um, I've been side hustling now for a while and trying to really dial that some of the side hustle businesses into something that's very consistent and using those monies to reinvest and grow those businesses. So that's, that's really it. And, you know, again, a lot of this stuff that you've probably heard before, but where we're unique as sellers is in no other profession do you have a chance to technically double your income in a year by just hitting your sales target. So the key is, again, getting great at sales, learning all the skill sets that come with being a good salesperson, 
and getting those big commission checks so you can then unlock a lot of these opportunities and start investing in these other vehicles. One thing that I'm looking at, Jesse, in this 2024, probably 2025, is investing in land. Um, and in Kentucky, you need to have over seven and a half acres to have a farm to be considered a farm. So that's what we're looking for. Um, so then we can have some other write-offs and do some more fun things on the land, yeah. grow some things, you know, that's, that's, uh, I think buying land is important. And, uh, I think home ownership is also very important. And if you're not there, it's like, that's a great, that's probably the first goal before even starting to invest is, uh, trying to get the house. But I mean, you know, again, we're not, uh, investment advisors. We're yeah, just we're, sale, we're, sales players. That's all we are. Sales players. Yeah. And and right. really just scratching the surface too. It's it's there's so many things you can invest in. These are just kind of the bread and butter, easy, low hanging fruit things as a seller that you can get access to next week. So happy investing in 2024. Here's to uh investing in yourself and you know leveling up your actual portfolio of stocks or real estate or whatever your thing is. And let us know what what you would invest in and uh you know what the best uh, next crypto coin is for us to invest in because I'm probably not gonna do that. <laughs> All right, all thanks All for right. peace out.